Morning, everybody. Genesis chapter 8, as we continue. Father God, we settle our hearts before you, and we thank you for your word. Lord, we do continue to pray for your mercy for Haiti, for the, the victims of this earthquake. Uh, the stories that we hear, Lord, are, are just gut-wrenching. We pray, Lord, for those who are down to assist medically that you would put order, Lord, in their efforts. And uh, you would bring again just safety and, and order to uh, the streets so that relief can reach these people. Thank you, Lord, for your faithfulness. We pray as we continue through your word that you would also be working in our hearts, strengthening our faith, drawing us to a deeper relationship with you. Pray, Lord, you bless this time. May your word speak to each heart in the room, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. And the waters prevailed exceedingly upon the earth, and all high hills that were under the whole heaven were covered. Fifteen cubits upward did the water prevail, and the mountains were covered, and all flesh died, that moved upon the earth, both of fowl and of cattle and of beast and of every creeping thing and everything upon the earth and every man. All in whose nostrils was the breath of life of all that was in the dry land died. And every living substance was destroyed, which was upon the face of the ground, both man and cattle and creeping things and the fowl of the heavens. And they were destroyed from the earth, and Noah only remained alive, and they that were with him in the ark. And the waters prevailed upon the earth a hundred and fifty days, and God remembered Noah. Did, did he forget him? Is that what, like, oh yeah, guy in the ark. No, it's the idea of God again began to direct his attention and care towards Noah. God remembered Noah and every living thing and all the cattle that was with him in the ark. And God made a wind to pass over the earth, and the waters assuage the idea is they began to recede it's sakak in the hebrew there to recede to be in a lower spatial position and it brings up some interesting things we weren't there and it doesn't tell us so all we can do is make some guesses but when you lose the water that is around the firmament which as we noted before would give you a more uniform temperature around the earth and obviously greenhouse effect and god knows how to balance that out so it was sustainable for human life but as you lose that barrier, now the poles are going to begin to get extreme temperatures and obviously cold. And if you've studied wind patterns, you know that they're influenced by the rotation of the earth. And so this is all now going to have to be established. So you've got cold areas, you've got high, you know, hot areas, warm areas of air, masses of air moving. And perhaps maybe for the first time, as Noah and his family are on the ark, they're hearing thunder showers and probably violent thunderstorms as these masses are beginning to get established in patterns. And, you know, they've, they're on the boat and, you know, flashes, and you're going, whoa, what was that? You know, and, and if you've ever been out, like, in the plain states, like Kansas, to hear a thunder shower, anybody been out there where there's nothing but just flat? It's, it's deafening, the noise that you get out there from thunderstorms. So these things are beginning to happen, and so air, air masses are moving, and, and, and all these things are now having to be established. It's a whole different world than what he knew before. We'll get into this a little next week with the fact that with the fountains of the deep breaking up, most likely, again, all that subterranean water that we now know exists, as that stuff came out, probably heated, because near magma chambers, if it's really heated, that would explain increased precipitation. It would explain increased snow. It would help us to understand. We'll look at it next week, the idea of, a, of an ice age. What would it be? How long? As we consider this information. So God made a wind <coughs> to pass over the earth, perhaps a very strong wind. We're not sure. But the waters began then to recede. The fountains also of the deep and the windows of heaven were stopped and the rain from heaven was restrained. And the waters returned from off the earth continually and after the end of 150 days, the waters were abated. The idea is to have gone to a lower position. These fountains of the deep, as they began to expel the water coming out and it would erode that land area as it's shooting out in some form, it would also take this debris and cover lots of things on the surface of the earth, which explains, obviously, how we get fossils, debris covering them quickly. 
But as those cavities would empty and these winds begin to move, perhaps violent winds, that may have begun to cause wave action that would collapse them. And then as they collapse, the waters would begin to recede back in. And I'll show you with some slides today, there's some interesting parallels between mountain chains and oceans. And that is the water seems to be dumping back into the oceans, which may well have been where those cavities are. And as they're getting pushed down, they're lifting up on other parts of a saturated surface of the earth, which is beginning to form these uplifts and other things we now observe on our surface, mountains, etc. As well as the fact we know volcanic activity was happening. Mount Ararat has pillow lava, and that is lava that forms underwater. So on Mount Ararat, there's evidence that it was also underwater as well as sedimentary rock. So these things are going on. And the waters begin to recede. And so the ark rested, verse 4, in the 17th month on the, or sorry, in the 7th month, the 17th month would be a long year, and the 7th month on the 17th day of the month upon the mountains of Ararat. Notice mountains, plural. That'll help us in a little bit. Five months. Something interesting to consider. It's following the Jewish calendar. The fifth month is the month of Nisan or Abib. The 17th day, Jesus would partake of the Passover with his disciples on the 14th day. The evening he would be betrayed. He would be handed over to the chief priests on Friday the 15th. He would go through a mock of a trial given to the Gentiles who would scourge him, beat him, crucify him. He'd be dead before sundown. He's buried. 16th is the Sabbath. Jesus would rise on the 17th day of the seventh month. Interesting, the ark, why, why the Holy Spirit gives this detail, we're not sure, but interesting, it appears the ark is resting same time as Jesus is rising. I like that. You can go home and study for yourself. The waters decreased continually until the 10th month. And in the 10th month, on the first day of the month, were the tops of the mountains seen. That had to be encouraging. <coughs> like, <laughs> finally, tops of the mountains were seen. And it came to pass at the end of 40 days that Noah opened the window of the ark which he had made. And he sent forth a raven, which went forth to and fro, until the waters were dried up from off the earth. And, and ravens have no problems landing in marshy, muddy, whatever. They don't care. If there's floating corpses, which most likely there is all kinds of dead floating things still, they're able to eat all, or it's able to eat all at once and fly around. And if it needs a dry spot, it can just land on the ark or the tops of the mountains. So the raven doesn't come back. So Noah sent forth a dove from him to see if the waters were abated from off the face of the ground. But the dove found no rest. <coughs> and they've noted these, these doves would prefer something dry, something not muddy. It didn't find a suitable place to rest. No rest for the sole of her foot. And she returned unto him in the ark. And doves have the habit of coming back to the place from where they have been nested. She returned to him in the ark. <coughs> for the waters were on the face of the whole earth. Then he put forth his hand and took her and pulled her in unto him into the ark. And he stayed yet other seven days. And you wonder if the family's going, would you quit messing with the birds? Can we just get off? I mean, come on. <laughs> you wonder if there was some advice on all this. He stayed yet another seven days and again sent forth the dove out of the ark. And the dove came in to him in the evening. She had to go a distance. And lo, in her mouth was an olive leaf. What does it say? plucked off. So it doesn't mean that the dove found it floating in the water. It landed on an olive tree and then, you know, finally <laughs> ripped it off and flew back with it. Now you get the idea of extending an olive branch. An olive leaf plucked off. Now, interestingly enough, historians tell us it has been ascertained that olive trees can bear leaves while being underwater. That's interesting. In fact, the, uh, Theoprastus and Pliny both mentioned trees that were growing in the Red Sea, olive trees that bore leaves. They can bear leaves even if they're underwater, obviously for some period of time. And so the fact that it comes back with an olive leaf has been borne out by history that they can survive a period of time completely underwater. So Noah knew that the waters were abated from off the earth. And he stayed yet another seven days. And that's where the family, come on, it's got a leaf in it. Another seven days. And he sent forth the dove, which returned not again unto him any more. And it came to pass in the 601st year, in the first month, the first day of the month, the waters were dried up from off the earth. And Noah removed the covering of the earth and looked, and behold, 
the face of the ground was dry. And man, what kind of emotions did he go through? Just, and there's no human beings. No cities, no towns, no animals. In the second month, on the seventh and twentieth day of the month, the earth was dried, one year and ten days later after it started. And God spake unto Noah, saying, Go. Why was he waiting? Well, God told him to come into the ark, so Noah realized God will tell him when it's time to leave. Go. Go forth of the ark, you and your wife and your sons and your sons' wives with you. And bring forth with you every living thing that is with you of all flesh. Interesting, when the flood got started, the Lord said, Come thou into the ark, not you and your family. When it's over now, the judgment's done, he says, Now, go. We didn't first love Jesus, did we? He first loved us. We didn't choose him. He what? <clears throat> he chose us. He drew us to himself. He said, come. And having come to him by faith, the judgment of God has been handled in our lives through his death on the cross and resurrection from the grave. And having come to him and having our judgment paid on the cross by Jesus, the next thing he says is, go into all the world, right? Teach him the things I've commanded you, baptizing in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Now, if, now that we've come to the Lord, now go. Interesting pattern here. Go out of the ark, you, your sons, your wives, your sons' wives with you. Bring forth with you every living thing that is with you of all flesh, both of fowl and of cattle and of every creeping thing that creeps upon the earth, that it may breed abundantly in the earth and be fruitful and multiply upon the earth. And Noah went forth and his sons and his wife and his sons' wives with him. You know, for 120 years, he looked like an idiot. The neighbors are going, <laughs> hey, Noah, what, what are you doing up there, man? Building an ark. Why are you building an ark, Noah? It's going to rain. What's rain, Noah? Judgment of God. God, really? You think he's going to judge us? Come on. Come on, we're having a barbecue. Come on down. 120 years, he looked like a fool. Because he's preparing for something they can't see. But he believes God's word. Jesus said it this way. Those who lose their lives for the gospel, what? Will gain them. But those who seek to preserve their lives will lose them. And so what looked like foolishness to all of Noah's neighbors for 120 years has now been borne out to be the wisest thing we could do. Believe the word of God and obey him. Interesting. Now, look, I'm sure they took their pots, their pans, a few household items, you know, but my guess is Noah probably didn't bother himself with upgrades, remodeling, or improvements to his home. Why? Because he knows it's going to get flooded. He spent his time obeying God, building the ark, and bringing the animals in. The neighbors, you know, they're upgrading, they're, they're remodeling, Bob Vila's there, you know, doing the whole thing. And, you know, and they're like, no, when are you going to get to it? I'm serving God, man. I've got a bigger agenda to take care of. Once again, what looks so foolish to the world. Now, thank God he was obedient. Because here we are. Can you take your house to heaven? Answer. Can you take your car? Some of you are happy about that. <laughs> I've had a few I was very happy about that. But you can take your family. Noah comes out of that ark with his wife, his sons, and their wives. Very important reminder. Where are you spending your time? What's really going to be with you? Oh, it looks foolish now that people around you don't know Jesus. But they're not the final judge. Interesting. So Noah comes out with his sons, their daughters, their wives, sorry, his wife, his, step his daughters in law. And so every beast and every creeping thing and every fowl whatsoever creepeth upon the earth after their kinds, and that's all they will reproduce after is their kind, went forth out of the ark. And so now he comes out the sole possessor of the earth. Wow. And Noah. Build it. First thing he does is he builds an altar, first one mentioned here, unto the Lord. And took of every clean beast and of every clean fowl and offered burnt offerings. That's wholly consumed. It's a totally committed or dedicated. Burnt offerings on the altar. You know, the animals had to scatter from there and spread out through the earth, right? I wonder if he started taking some for sacrifice. The others went, whoa, and like started just running, you know. He fed us all that time, but now he's, you know. Sorry, I see things that way. And the Lord smelled a sweet savor. The idea is a savor of rest. It was acceptable to him. 
And the Lord said in his heart, I will not again curse the ground any more for man's sake. For the imagination of his heart is evil from his youth. Amen. It's true, isn't it? And what gets me is I know Christ. My life has been changed. I, 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 he saved me from my sins. And yet that stuff's still in my heart. I'm still having to deal with it by the grace of God. Maybe you can relate. The imagination of his heart is evil from his youth. By the way, this, in theology, this is where they come up with the idea of original sin, but also universal depravity, and that is man is helpless to save himself. Man cannot save himself. God acknowledges that. Someone else has to save us. And so Jesus would come born of a virgin. Why? Because then he's not born with original sin, the God-man, fully God without sin, but fully man, able to lay down his life, die a physical death, and shed literal blood to fulfill the law of God, but able to take his life up again on the third day and rise again. And so through faith in him, he is our atoning sacrifice that God will accept. Through faith in Christ alone, we are made righteous. We'll never be righteous, but we're made righteous before God because we believe the word of God and we've received his son. And so the heart of man is evil from his youth. Neither will I again smite every, any more everything living as I have done. Now, if it was a local flood, have there been local floods that have wiped things out? Yeah, like the tsunami? So if it was a local flood, here God lied, which is why it's got to be a global flood. While the earth remains, and Jesus said heaven and earth will pass away, Matthew 24, 35, but what? His words will not pass away. While the earth remains, seed time and harvest, cold and heat, summer and winter, something Noah had not experienced, and day and night shall not cease. Some cultures actually reckon six seasons, some say based on this. All right, but now let's consider, if there's a global flood, let's look at some of the evidence of what would that leave on the earth. So we've got a few slides today, not nearly as rough as last week. Uh, it was fun to watch last week. <laughs> Here we go. Okay, once again, we appreciate Answers in Genesis. I encourage you to go check out their ministry. They have a great museum out towards Ohio, Kentucky, the border there. If you can go, go. Maybe someday we'll get a few buses and take a field trip and have fun and, and enjoy Christian liberty and all kinds of nonsense that we always like to do. So Creation Science Evangelism, another ministry we appreciate. You can check them out. <coughs> Here's where we are. Seventh month, 17th day of the month, the ark rested on the mountains, plural, Vararat. That's basically eastern Turkey, Armenia, slash near Iran. Interestingly enough, on some old maps, you can actually find a town or an area called Nohu Ungamisi, which is Noah's big boat. <laughs> I mean, it's good for tourism, I know, there could be, but there's all kinds of names around here that are variant Valley of Eight, all kinds of things, and you can look at them yourself because we won't have time. But there are two main theories, and there are others, about the location of where is Noah's Ark. And I will give them to you, and you can go home and study them for yourself. According, you know, obviously assuming that a 4,400-year-old boat is still around, hasn't rotted completely, but here's the evidence. One is, some think this, or think this is Noah's Ark on Mount Ararat, about 15,000 feet in elevation. And what's the history? Well, how many have heard of U2, and I don't mean the band. How many remember what the U2 spy plane was long, long ago? If you're old enough, you remember. This was our intelligence gathering apparatus before satellites. U2 spy plane... In 1949, after filming the Soviet Union, came out and snapped these photos of Mount Ararat. And it got the attention of the intelligence community. And these things were classified for a long, long time. They've declassified them now. I've seen, I've seen basically what our photos developed from those negatives. A friend of mine has them, seen them. And it got the attention of the CIA and others. There's a man uh, whose name is, uh, where is he in here? Let's see. Yeah, Portia Taylor, assistant professor at the University of Richmond in Virginia, said to be an expert on satellite imaging, diplomacy, news media. He's been following this thing since 1993, it looks like. I'm sorry, it's small text up here. Including these 1949 aerial photographs. Well, this is from the Washington Times, 1997. They started getting also some satellite imagery starting in the 70s. As they kept looking in this area, they kept finding this anomaly. And so former high-ranking U.S. intelligence official who has seen the satellite photograph of the site produced around 1973 said analysts at the time were surprised when close-ups revealed what looked like a large curved wooden beams 
resembling the part of a hull of a boat protruding from the snow. That's what the CIA does all day. <laughs> they sort of curve over and formed up what would have been the bow of something or other poking out of the ice, the former official said, speaking on condition of anonymity, and don't they all. Enlargements of the spy photo photographs also produced what appeared to be stratifications or striations in the formation that appeared to be what was once wood. So you see the circle there and then that's the blow up. Does anybody wish we had better resolution? Am I the only one? Okay, good, I'm not alone. Then came this from 2003 from Digital Globe's QuickBird satellite. Looking around the same area again, about 15,000 feet in elevation. This thing has about a six to one ratio, which is the dimensions of the arc, and it's about 1,000 feet long, which means it was a bigger cupid than we assume and had a lot more volume. But they found this item up here again, studying it, and this guy Taylor continues, and he said this, I had no preconceived notion or agendas when I began in 1993 as to what I was looking for. He said, I maintain that if it is the remains of something man-made and potentially nautical, then it's, a potent it's potentially something of biblical proportions. He's still not sure. He's studying it hard. By the way, if you get on the web and you look up Noah's Ark, you're going to get all kinds of like, yeah, okay. But if you look up the Ararat anomaly, that's what this is called, you'll find all kinds of information. You can go home, play with it yourself. Remember, here is a full-scale model in Hong Kong. This is a very large ship. That's a bus. Those are people. They've done some research on this and they see a, a kind of a curving over of snow that seems to be hanging off the edge of some object. They think maybe the deck. But they're working on it. Apparently it's not easy to get to. These photos showed up in 2005. Somebody was snapping pictures of the mountain here and what do you know, that red circle, they didn't notice it at the time. They realized it later when they looked at their photos that there was an object on the side of the mountain. There's the blow up of it. Again, it looks like a large man-made object. They're still trying to get up. Different people claim they're trying to climb there, and some say they've seen it, and you can go home and look at it for yourself. But the fact is, there's something up on this Mount Ararat that's really confusing a lot of people with cameras. I have a personal opinion. You know in Revelation when the sun becomes much brighter during the tribulation? Remember that, if you were here for that? I think that's when God basically just melts the snow and goes, <laughs> puts his own track out on Mount Ararat. Here you go. Just personal opinion. There's another theory from Ron Wyatt. If you're familiar at all with his, his work, uh, he photographed chariot wheels in the Red Sea, which have since been photographed by two other parties. There was an exodus. He thinks it's this, this structure here 17 miles away. Government eventually put up a tourist center there. It's 1987. What Ron Wyatt found was this, this remains in the earth, about 300 cubits long, about 515 feet, and it's basically just a, a, a ridge or a lump, a basically a giant, you know, long boat-like shape that looks like it just rotted and collapsed in. But again, it's about that size of that very large ship that we talked about in dimensions. And you can see in the bottom right here kind of the ridge is going wrong. See that? Looks like the deck fell in, the walls are up. Everybody see that? Wyatt thinks that this is it. You can go look at it for yourself. Turkish government put up a visitor center. Answers in Genesis, those folks looked it over. They don't agree with them. Ken Hoban, who is another creation ministry, does feel that Wy Ron Wyatt is on to something. The good news is now you know what to do with your time this week and looking things over. You can go play with it. But his theory is that the ark actually decayed, the walls fell out, top came down, and so this is the remains of a wooden structure that is rotted. And part of why they feel this is a site is because they found iron rivets all around it. There's other information you can get on their website. Go take a look. They also found some interesting things. They found these large stones weighing thousands of pounds with holes bored through the top that they theorized were used to help stabilize the ark while in rough sea. And these things are clearly man-made. So now you have some fun homework you can go check out. Those are the two main theories, and I told you, and you can go look at it, and I won't even vote. So what happened? Canopy of water came down from overhead. The fountains of the deep came up. We now know from science, thank you, that about 400 kilometers under the earth is enough water to, to take care of our oceans 10 times over. So yes, there is plenty of water on this earth to flood it. And yes, when those cavities began to collapse, water would recede back. It would be pushing down, lifting up other parts of the earth. Water's pulling back, going back into these cavities, creating deep ocean ridges, and these things we can now start looking at. All right, the water's decreased, as well as everything else that got shaken with it. 
Here's some interesting things to look at. <clears throat> you can do this at home. Grab a map of the Earth without the ocean, and you will notice that the mountain chains, like the Rockies, parallel the coasts. Like as the water's going back down in, it's pushing up the Earth. And remember, this is super saturated land masses with water, 15 cubits above the highest mountain. Same thing in South America. Same thing here, Appalachians. Running along the coast. In fact, you look around, you find it's pretty consistent around the Earth. You see, when you got a whole bunch of water and magma activity going on and volcanoes erupting and all this stuff, it's all very pliable in this water-saturated stage. And it begins to help us understand how we find these different strange-looking phenomena on the Earth where layers are wrapped and warped and twisted, but there's no erosion between them. So it means it happened in a quick event. Here, no erosion between these layers, which means it happened quickly. How did the Earth get suddenly changed with layers being moved all over the place and settling out? And we talked about how things settle out last week. Here again, layers twisted, warped, and yet no erosion between them. The flood helps to easily understand these strange features around the Earth's surface. All right, so the water's receded. Let's talk about this, Grand Canyon. How many, when you were in school, were told Grand Canyon was carved over millions of years by the Colorado River? Raise your hands. I mean, how many of you remember that in your textbook? Okay, let's start with a fact. The fact is Grand Canyon exists. Does anybody have a problem with that? Everybody okay with that today? All right. Now it's how do we interpret that fact? The evolutionists have their interpretation. The creationists or people who hold to the scriptures have their interpretation. The evolutionists say it forms slowly by a little bit of water carving through over millions of years. Interestingly enough, as these things are being further researched, they're beginning to try a new strategy here. And that is maybe it happened quickly, but that you can keep up with that on your own. Let's just look at what's there. Whoops, wrong thumb. Then the creationists say, no, we think it formed quickly by lots of water over a little time. How many agree these are two different opinions? All right. Fact is, the Earth has layers of sedimentary rock. That's there. Now let's consider them and see what fits. They say the layers form slowly with deposition of debris over millions of years. But the problem is, there's no erosion between them. How can it sit on the surface for millions of years with rain and other things happening, and yet no erosion? Creationists say, uh-uh, these layers are quickly laid down with a flood. All right. Problem is, often the evolutionists will put into their definition or their facts essentially an assumption. They say, we know it formed over millions of years. Answer, who was there? Nobody. So how do we know that? Well, we don't, but that's what they think. We know it was a slow deposition. Who said, who was there? Nobody. So we can't count those assumptions. What we do know is that the United States has been covered by large bodies of water in its history, including in, for example, South Dakota and other places, you find seashells and things. Crazy. We had water over there, over the United States. And one big collection of water was near the Grand Canyon. In fact, as we look at this, what we'll find is if you build a, gr a dam against the Grand Canyon or across it, you would get a river, or a lake, sorry, forming behind it. Of course, here with Marsh Creek, that's easy. How many remember Milford, the town? That's now been buried by Marsh Creek. It, you just dam it up and in it comes, right? Okay, here's the Grand Canyon. Here's the usual science textbook answer, 1992. Over millions of years, the Colorado River has carved out the Grand Canyon from solid rock. Was anybody there? Answer, no, okay? Notice there's no erosion between these layers. You see that? Tight bands, okay? Here it is again, tight bands. It's part of its beauty. Here's another thing. The Colorado River has cut through layer upon layer of rock over millions of years, 1998. Again, clearly there was water behind it, but rather than carving slowly, what looks like we have is actually a breached land dam, and thanks to Mount St. Helens, we can now begin to put this puzzle together. Here is an aerial picture of the Grand Canyon. How many see the white stuff on either side of it? How many see that? Two of you. Three of you. That is the Kayabap uplift, and they are snow-capped, or they're covered in snow. Everybody see how it goes right through the canyon? Everybody got that? Okay. The height of that is 6,900 feet to 8,500 feet, that uplift. 
Now, the river enters the Grand Canyon at 2,800 feet in elevation, and it comes out at 1,800 feet. Water flows downhill. How many agree with that one? Okay, that looks easy until you realize that that uplift went right through that canyon. What am I telling you? Well, if you see that uplift, that water had to flow over that uplift and carve it to get down to 1,800 feet. What am I telling you? Well, the water comes in at 2,800 feet, had to get over that uplift, which is anywhere from 6,900 to 8,500 feet, to then eventually carve it down to 1,800 feet. That uplift is 6,900 to 8,500 feet. It comes out at 1,800 feet. If you're not following me, try this. What they're telling you is that Colorado River had to flow uphill about a mile for millions of years to cut that uplift. Does that make sense? Well, how do you know the uplift was there? Well, uh, okay, but let's look at Mount St. Helens for a minute. What we have most likely, and because we know there was a large body of water behind this, is a breached land dam. Mount St. Helens helped us with this quite a bit. Let's take a look. Comes in, now some things we need to consider, all right? Number one, the top middle Kaibab uplift is higher than the bottom of the canyon by a mile. That's factual, go look at it. The river runs through the bottom. The top is higher where the river enters or sorry, the top of it is higher than where the river enters by 4,000 feet. You know, you look at those side views and you see those little peaks, right? Cut through, that was higher. Okay, water or rivers do not flow uphill. We know this. There is no large delta. At the bottom of the Mississippi River, there's the Mississippi River Delta. At the bottom of the Nile, there's a Nile River Delta. We don't have those at the bottom of the Colorado River. We got a little, but nothing like what should be there for carving this thing over millions of years slowly and taking the debris out. It's not there. That's a missing piece. Based on the physical evidence, that river didn't make the canyon. All right, well then how did we get it? Well, you know, interestingly enough, the Mediterranean Sea, they're now looking at it with a new theory saying, it looks like the Rock of Gibraltar area got breached and that suddenly spilled over from the ocean and filled that up. They're starting to look at things a little differently as they're realizing lots of things can happen quickly if you have enough water and enough pressure and enough things going on from a geological perspective. Now, Mount St. Helens, let's talk about that. It's just a little guy compared to some of its volcano buddies, but it did some real damage. 1980, right? Here's May 18th, 1980, Mount St. Helens. Isn't it lovely? And then it erupted. And by the way, when that face came down on the north side, it went down and hit, for one part, Spirit Lake. Spirit Lake being hit by the mud went up 300 feet on the other side and stripped everything off the side of that half of the mountain. Just raked it all back down into the Spirit Lake area. And by the way, when this thing went, it uncorked and leased all kinds of steam and ash and heat, and it got ugly fast. And again, it's just a little guy compared to some of its buddies. And it threw steam and heat and ash all over the place. And they've got tons of photos of this. And it buried things quickly. Lots of things quickly. This was so massive it showed up on radar. It spread debris all over the place. And this is just a little volcano. Steam and ash went driving out from this thing. They have some incredible photos of this as it all went down. And interestingly enough, very quickly after this ash and steam came out, it formed in layers. And we know the time people because they photographed this thing. Massive amount of debris. Look what it did to the trees flattened by the eruption. It just blew stuff apart. Stripped off the green material. Here's more of them. Really made a mess of rivers with all that debris. These are large triaxial dump trucks. Incredible devastation within hours. Took a while to get the logs out. Other things happen, including you know, mud covering ice, blocks of ice, et cetera, et cetera. But notice the cone there in the middle of the picture. See how it's got like a, a lighter slope going up to the top of the picture? You see that blue on the right? Looks like a mitten. That's Spirit Lake, and that's where the mud came flying down. Hit Spirit Lake, it went up the other side. There it came down, hit the lake, and stripped off all that material back into it. So we had some interesting formations here with the snow and ice and 
kinds of stuff happening. There was a landslide on May 18th, and it buried a river and a highway to Spirit Lake to an average depth of 100 feet. You could bury a lot of things in 100 feet. It also buried most other drainages in the 23 square miles of the upper Toodle Valley and plugged the valley's mouth, created a land dam. For 22 months, water had no established path to the lower waterway. It looked like this. Note the land dam. And it just kept rising behind it. Nowhere to go. <clears throat> then, on March 19, 1982, an eruption melted a large snowpack that had accumulated in the crater over the winter. The waters mixed with the loose material on the slopes of the mountain, creating an enormous mud flow in nine hours. How many hours? They documented this. Nine hours while no eye watched, mud flow carved an integrated system of drainages over much of the valley and reopened the way to the Pacific Ocean. The drainages included at least three canyons 100 feet deep. One was nicknamed the Little Grand Canyon of the Tootle because it was 1 40th a scale of the Grand Canyon. And here it is, 1,000 feet wide, 140 feet deep, and gee, does this sound familiar? A little river at the bottom. And interestingly enough, the layers have no erosion between them, and they're all over the place. And it happened in how many hours? Nine hours, not millions of years. And it's 1 40th of the Grand Canyon. So, see those high peaks? Had to flow uphill a mile, huh? No erosion, huh? I think a flood fits it better. But they don't tell you that. But they are working on their theory because they know they got some problems. Now, remember those logs came down Spirit Lake? Remember all the debris? We got to keep this moving. Stripped it all bare. Dumped it in Spirit Lake. See the school buses for size? Logs all over the place. And as the logs were floating, they were rubbing each other. And as they rubbed each other, they stripped each other of bark. And that all began to go down to the bottom. And guess how it settled out? In layers. That began to make them think a little bit. Say, what if you flood the planet, strip everything off, it's all rubbing together, and it begins to settle? What are you going to get at the bottom? Layers with living things trapped in it. So they started watching this carefully. And these tree trunks that were there were eventually, they were horizontal, but then they get waterlogged, and eventually they would just sink. And as they would sink, they would embed down in the bottom. So they decided to go do some research on this. Here they are in the nice cold water. Here they are around the logs. And here's what's going on underneath the water. And these things are water, they're getting saturated, going down, and they were sinking up to 15 feet down in these layers that came from the outer material and the mud. Some were roots down, top up. Others were top down, roots up. Some were diagonal, some were flat, so all kinds of crazy positions. You're thinking, <laughs> what do I care? Well, as these things rubbed off and this material got deposited at the bottom, it began to become pretty obvious where you get coal from. A big flood. And by the way, in 36 weeks, they can make coal in the laboratory with 150 degrees Celsius pressure and other things. This can be done in a short period of time, not millions of years, for the right conditions. And remember, this stuff was really buried. Now, here's the problem. All around the planet, they find these polystrate fossils. These are trees growing through different, what should be millions of years, of layers of rock that have no erosion between them. And poof, here these things are showing up all over the planet. Some have roots down and top up. Others have roots up and top down. How does a tree grow with its roots sticking out in the air for millions of years through hard layers? Answer, it doesn't make any sense. And before Mount St. Helens, they were scratching their heads with this stuff. Nova Scotia, they're, by the way, they're Nova Scotia, Germany, France, the British Isles, Nova California, Eastern states. Maybe you've seen some. Here's in France. Petrified trees in Yellowstone National Park. 27 layers of forest specimen ridge in Yellowstone. Some upside down, some right side up, some horizontal, some diagonal. And they, uh, uh, now after Mount St. Helens, something flooded that area, waterlogged those trees, dropped them down in the sediment. Real simple. Here is an article from 1976, that is four years before Mount St. Helens. Everybody with me? 
Listen to this. It is not uncommon to find marine fossils such as fish, mollusks, brachiopods, and coal. Coal balls, which are rounded masses of matted and exceptionally well-preserved plant and animal fossils, including marine creatures, are found within coal strata and associated with coal strata. Among the most fascinating types of fossils associated with coal seams are upright tree trunks, four years before Mount St. Helens, which often penetrate tens of feet perpendicular to stratification. These upright trees are frequently encountered in strata associated with coal and on rare occurrences are found in the coal. In each case, the sediments must have amassed in a short time to cover the tree before it could rot and fall down. Remember, some are upside down. One's first impression may be that these upright trees are in their original growth position, but several lines of evidence indicate otherwise. Some of the trees penetrate the strata diagonally, while others are found upside down. Sometimes an upright tree appears to be rooted in growth position in a stratum which is entirely penetrated by a second upright tree. The hollow trunks are commonly filled with sediment unlike the immediate, immediate surrounding rocks. In 1974, they're going, huh. After 1980, ha. We know how they got there. Just depends if you have eyes to see it. We're out of time. Let's stand and pray. Father God, we thank you for your word. Noah looked like an absolute fool until the judgment came. As your word tells us, it's appointed once for a man to die and then comes the judgment. Every one of us will stand before you and give an account. For those of us who have received the gift of salvation through your son, we're forgiven, not because of our work, but because of his death and resurrection on the, from the cross, Lord. And so I pray for anyone here, maybe the things they learned in science class turned them from you. But if they have eyes to see, you have left so much evidence around this earth. There was a global flood. There is evidence all around the planet. In fact, it took till 1980 to understand, really, these polystrate fossils and trees. Same time that CNN went online, and all the world could behold a news item in real time, which now makes Revelation 11 possible. Interesting how you work. I pray for anyone here that doesn't know you. You'd open their hearts, they'd come to you by faith, and let their lives be changed through the grace of God, through Jesus Christ. Thank you for these things. Please go with us this week, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs>